So this lecture is part of an online course on the theory of numbers and will be about linear Diophantine equations. So Diophantine means you want integer solutions and linear just means you don't have x squared or x cubed or anything turning up. So um, if we've got only one equation and one unknown, then this just says ax equals c, which is completely trivial. So let's look at the case where we've got two unknowns, x and y, and one equation. So we're given a, b, and c, and we want to find x and y satisfying this. There's an obvious necessary condition. The greatest common divisor of a and b must divide the left-hand side, so it must divide c, and we want to show that this condition is also sufficient. Um, well, the easiest way to explain this is to do an explicit example. So, as, so suppose we want to solve 71x plus 17y equals 1, and we notice the greatest common divisor of 71 and 17 is 1, which divides 1, so we're OK. And the idea is we start by applying Euclid's algorithm to find the greatest common divisor of 71 and 17. This seems a bit silly because it's kind of obvious what the greatest common divisor is, but let's apply Euclid's algorithm anyway. So we have 71 is equal to 4 times 17 plus 3, so we divide 71 by 17 and get the remainder. Then we say 17 is 5 times 3 plus 2, 3 is equal to 1 times 2 plus 1, and 2 is equal to 2 times 1, plus zero. And since we've got zero here, the algorithm stops and the greatest common divisor is, is this number one. Um, well, I'm going to write a 71 up here and, and we kind of look at these numbers in this column. And um, the, the point is that the greatest common divisor of any two is equal to one. And we can use that to write 1 as a linear combination of any two of these by starting at the bottom and working upwards. So we, we, we now do the calculation like this. First of all, we can write 1 is equal to 3 minus 1 times 2 by using this equation here. Then we can write 1 is equal to 3 minus 1 times 17 minus 5 times 3. Um, and here we're using the fact that 2 is equal to 17 minus 5 times 3, so, so this becomes 6 times 3 minus 1 times 17. So now we've written 1 as a, as a linear combination of 3 and 17. And now we work up again, we write 1 is equal to 6 times 71 minus 4 times 17. So that's because we can write 3 as 71 minus 4 times 17. So, 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 so this bit here is 3 and uh, this bit here is, is the 2, uh, I guess, uh, sorry, I haven't finished yet, minus 1 times 17, which is equal to 6 times 71 minus 25 times 17. So there we've written 1 as a linear combination of 71 and um, 17. So, so, so we have um, 6 times 71 minus 25 times 17 equals 1, which is a solution to our original equation. Um, well, of course, for a number as small as 71 and 17, there's no big deal about finding 6 and 25. We would just find these by trial and error if we wanted. But you notice that um, th this would actually work even if A, B, and C were absolutely huge. You know, suppose A, B, and C each had a thousand digits in or something like that. You, you couldn't possibly solve the equation by trial and error, but on, a, on a, any reasonable computer, um, it would be still fairly fast to find x and y because, as we saw last lecture, Euclid's algorithm is actually pretty fast. Um, by the way, here we're using the version of Euclid's algorithm with division with remainder. Um, I mentioned there was actually a more efficient way of finding the greatest common divisor where you only divide by 2 and use subtraction and don't do division at all. And you can also use that to solve linear Diophantine equations. In fact, it's probably... It's probably even faster if x and y are, are, are very large. Um, anyway, um, you can see from this that we can solve ax plus by equals c 
for x and y if and only if um, the highest common greatest common divisor of a and b divides c. Now on the one hand this condition is obviously necessary On the other hand, it's also sufficient because we can solve ax plus by is the greatest common divisor by using Euclid's algorithm as above. Um, we've done it for 71 and 17, but it should be kind of obvious that this would work for any pair of numbers and give their greatest common divisor. And then we can just multiply this by um, c over ab, so we would find... Um, um, if we multiply by c over a b, then we find a times x times c over a b plus b times y times c over a b is equal to c. So, um, so th this is we, we have complete control over this equation. There's a simple criterion for when we can solve it. And we've got a really fast algorithm for solving it if it's solvable. Um, incidentally, the same works for um, polynomials over a field. In other words, if we want to solve um, um, ax times p of x plus bx times q of x equals um, um, c of x, where a, b and c are given polynomials and we want to find p and q, then we can solve it in the same way. The, the, the point is that polynomials over a field have a sort of Euclidean algorithm. Um, if, if we've got two polynomials, um, px, sorry, um, ax and bx, then we can write ax equals q times q of x times b of x plus r of x, where the degree of r is less than the degree of um, b. And this is just like the condition for division with the remainder we had for integers, except that we're using the degree rather than the absolute value. So we can find an analogue of Euclid's algorithm for polynomials in one variable and solve equations like this. Um, well, Euclid would not have been too happy with, with our solution of ax plus by equals c because he didn't actually really like negative numbers and didn't really use them at all. I mean, for Euclid, a number was the length of a line, and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to have a negative length of a line. So, so we can ask the following question. Suppose a, b, and c are greater than or equal to zero. Can we solve for um, x, y with x and y greater than or equal to zero? Um, actually, strictly speaking, Euclid didn't really count zero as a number either, so he would probably have insisted that x and y should be at least one, but we'll do the case that x and y are at least zero because there's not really a lot of difference between them. So let's look at an example. Let's solve 7x plus 5y equals c and ask what possible values can we find for c with x and y greater than or equal to zero. Um, obviously, if we allow x and y to be negative, then we can solve for all integers c by what we've just said. Well, well let's just take a look and see which values of c we can get. So, um, we have 5 times something, so, so 5y can be 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 7x can be any multiple of 7, so we get 7, 14, 21, 28. So the possible values of 7x plus 5y look like this. We get 7, 12, 17, 22, 27, um, 14, 19, 24, 29, and so on, 21, 26, 31, um, and so on. And now, if we look here, we get some 
sort of random looking numbers. You know, we, we can get five and seven, we don't get eight, we don't get nine, we get 10, we don't get 11 and so on. However, if you go up to far enough, suppose you go up to 24, then we get 24, we also get 25, we get 26, we get 27, we get 28, we get 29, um, and um, we get 30, uh, this 30 is over here, We get 30, 31, and we seem to be getting all numbers greater than or equal to 24. Um, so can be any number greater than or equal to 24. Well, we haven't quite proved this yet, but it certainly it suggests that we can solve this for any sufficiently large number c divisible by the greatest common divisor. And for numbers less than this, this critical number, well, it's, the, the, it seems to be kind of random. It's not clear what's going on. And let's show that this is true and find out what this critical number actually is. So suppose we're trying to solve, suppose we found a solution of 7x plus 5y equals n, where, where we're allowing x and y to be possibly negative. Well, suppose x is negative. We, that, that, then what we can do is we can change x and y if, if, if we add 5 to x and subtract 7 from y, then the answer is still 7. So we've made x bigger at the cost of making y smaller. Um, well, suppose suppose we can't solve for n. Well, well suppose we make we, we, we keep on making x bigger until it's just less than 0. So, 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 so here x is going to be less than zero and here x plus five is going to be greater than or equal to zero. So, so we're sort of looking at the critical point at which x goes from being negative to being positive. Now if we can't solve for n then this thing here has to be less than zero otherwise we would have a solution. So what's the largest value of n? So what's the largest possible n? Well um, we want x and y to be as big as possible given these constraints. So, so we would take x equals minus 1 and y minus 7 equals minus 1. And this gives us 7x plus 5y equals n. So n is 7 times minus 1 um, um, plus 5 times 7 minus 1 which is equal to 7 times 5 minus 7 minus 5, which is equal to 23. So this is the largest number you can't represent as a sum of positive, or rather, sorry, non-negative linear combinations of 5 and 7. And you see in this argument there's nothing special about 5 and 7. If we're trying to solve ax plus by equals c for, for xy, greater than or equal to 0 and the greatest common divisor of a and b divides c, then this is possible. So let's so let's take let's take the greatest common divisor of a and b to be equal to 1, just for um, um, make things a little bit simpler. Then this is possible for c um, greater than a b minus a minus b. So we've shown that a b minus a minus b is the smallest, is, sorry, is the largest number which you can't solve this equation for. You can think of this as being a sort of stamp problem. Suppose for some reason you could only buy stamps that, that, that cost either five cents or seven cents. Then you can send a letter for any postage greater than 23 cents. Um, Next, we can ask, well, we've done equations with two unknowns. What about three unknowns? So suppose we try and solve ax plus by plus cz equals d. Um, well, this can quite easily be reduced to the two-variable case. So we can solve ar plus bs is the greatest common divisor of a and b. And then we can solve tab plus u um, times c is equal to the um, greatest common multiple of a, b, and c. 
which is just a, b, c. And then if we can solve this equation, we can solve this equation, then we can um, just multiply this equation by t and add it to that and solve our original equation. So we can solve um, if a, b, c divides d. And this gives us a necessary and sufficient condition. And of course, we can solve this rather quickly using Euclid's algorithm. So um, um, linear, a single linear equation in any other un unknowns can easily be reduced to the case of linear equations in two unknowns, which can be done with Euclid's algorithm. Um, by the way, if you want to solve things like ax plus by plus cz equals d for x, y, and z greater than or equal to zero, this is kind of tricky. Um, um, you can solve it, uh, let's assume a, b, and c is equal to one. You can solve it for all large values of d, but finding the minimum value of d um, is, is, is quite a lot trickier than, than, than for the case when you've just got two variables. Um, so that's pretty much dealt with the case of one equation in two or more unknowns. What about several linear equations? So suppose you've got a system a11x1 plus a1nxn equals c1, a21x1 plus a... Um, 2n x n equals c2 all the way down to a m n m1 x1 plus a m n x n equals uh, c m. So this is just like in linear algebra. Now if we were doing this over a field um, you know, we can reduce to echelon form and um, we would just, um, if, if we write this as a matrix equation A x equals C, where we're, we're using um, uh, various vectors and so on for A and C, then we can reduce to the case of a matrix which looks like this. or it may have um, more zeros elsewhere and so on. And once we've reduced to this form, then it's easy to solve. The problem is if we're working over the integers, we can't do this because, I mean, you know, you'd have to start by taking a11 being non-zero, and then you would subtract a multiple of a11 from a21 to make it zero. And we, we can do that over a field, but we can't do it over the integers. So what do we do over the integers? Well, over the integers, what we're going to do is we use row and column operations to make A11 as small as possible, or rather make its absolute value as small as possible, greater than zero if, if necessary. By row and column operations, I mean on this matrix A, we're allowed to add multiples of any row to any other row. And similarly, we're allowed to add and subtract multiples of any column from any other column. And if we make A11 as small as possible, then we can subtract multiples of A11 from everything in the first row and everything in the first column to make um, the other entries of row one, column one equal to zero. And then we can just repeat this and make the um, matrix more or less diagonal. Um, I think um, this will become clearer if I actually work out an example. So suppose we've got the system of equations 2x plus 3y plus 4z equals 5 and 6x plus 7y plus 8z equals 9. So we can write this in terms of matrices. We have 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8 multiplied by x, y, z equals 5, 9. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to do row and column operations on this matrix um, in order to 
keep simplifying. And you'll see that doing these row and column operations is, looks very much like Euclid's algorithm. So first, what we can do is we can, um, here we, we've got a two and a three, so we can subtract a multiple of column one from column two in order to make this entry smaller. So obviously to do that, we just subtract a, um, a copy of one copy of column one from copy two. So we get two, one, four, six, one, eight. But you've got to be a bit careful here because in doing that, we actually have to change these variables and we, we change these to x plus y, y and z. So you see what we're doing is we're, we're subtracting column one from column two here and we're adding row two to row one then. If you sort of think about it a bit, you'll see that this, this makes the equation stay the same. Um, and now what we can do is we can subtract um, a multiple of, we, we, we can subtract a multiple of the first row from the second row in order to make this entry zero. So we get two, one, four, um, four, zero, four, x plus y, y, z equals five, four. And now here we're doing a row operation. And if you do a row operation, you don't need to fiddle with this, with this matrix here, but you do need to fiddle with the right hand side. So, so row operations change this bit here and column operations change this bit here. Um, and now we're going to do some more column operations. So we're going to subtract twice this column from this um, column here. So that will produce 0, 4, 1, 0. And we're going to subtract four times this column from this column. So we get 0, 4. And then we need to do something complicated here. So we need to add twice this and four times this to that. So um, here we change this to x plus y and then we get 3y plus 2x plus 4z here, and then we get z here, and this is equal to 5, 4. Um, and now we can subtract column 1 from column 3, so we get 0, 1, 4, 0, 0, 0. And um, again, we're doing column operations, so we need to do something to this, and what we need to do to this is get x plus y plus z. 3y plus 2x plus 4z, z equals um, 5, 4. Um, and now what we can do is we can work backwards. You see this matrix is more or less diagonal, at least it would be if I, if I swap the first two rows around. And I'm not going to swap the first two rows because I've run out of room, but it doesn't really matter. And now um, you can see that this equation says zero times z is, is undefined. So z can be anything. So, um, well, what are x and y? Well, we don't know, but we have to work backwards. Um, so, so we know 3y plus 2x plus 4z um, is equal to 5. You've got to be a bit careful. You might think it's equal to 4, but notice that's not in the top left position. And um, we know 4 times x plus y plus z is equal to 4, so x plus y plus z is equal to 1. Okay, now we can work backwards. So um, now we can work out what x plus y is from this. So x plus y is going to be x plus y plus z minus z, which is, well, we don't know what z is. So let's just write this as 1 minus z. So z is something. And then we can keep going backwards. So um, next we can, so, so, so that's found this x plus y. Next we can find this y by um, working um, backwards from here. So you see this y is going to be this thing here minus uh, 2 times x plus y minus 4 times z. So y is going to be um, um, 
this stuff here, which is 5, minus 2 times x plus y, which is 1 minus c, um, minus 4 times z, which is 3 minus 2z. And finally, we can work out x in the same way by saying it's x plus y minus y. So this is x plus y minus y, which turns out to be 2 minus 2 plus c. So here we found the solution. We can pick any value of z and then y is equal to 3 minus 2z and x is equal to 2 minus, minus 2 plus c. And it should be reasonably obvious that if you've got any system of linear equations and you want to solve them for integers, then you can do a similar sort of thing and either find that they've got no solutions or find a neat description of all solutions. Um, incidentally, um, this method of solving linear systems of Diophantine equations turns up when you're studying finitely generated abelian groups. Um, in pretty much exactly this argument here proves the theorem in, in abstract algebra that any finitely generated abelian group is a, a direct sum of cyclic groups. That's just a sort of fancy way of saying you can solve linear systems of linear Diophantine equations by reducing the matrix to a sort of diagonal form. Um, 